So welcome everybody. Um, let me see if I can see you guys coming in. Yep, it's growing 15, 19. So we're just gonna take a few minutes as everybody's coming in to uh, let the room fill up. And um, let's uh, welcome you all to the webinar. It's our Saturday webinar, so I'm expecting a large crowd. Uh, last time we apologized, we, we, we didn't realize our Zoom account wouldn't let us have more than 100 people on the call, but we upped that. So we should be able to um, <clears throat> get up to 500 on this call actually. So uh, more than enough for based on the, the amount of people that have signed up for the program. Um, we got about 300 of you signed up. So I expect the, the, the attendee list will grow and we'll see what happens. Um, hope everybody's having an awesome weekend. I hope you're doing well. Um, we got some stuff coming in via the chat. Hey, uh, to that end, guys, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A. That way we can see them more clearly. Yeah, if you, if you just want to make comments, talk to each other, you want to ask a coach that's in the background, like Anna, Mike, Josh, a question, or you want them to respond, uh, put that in the chat, and they can be monitoring the chat for you guys. You know, anything that comes up. Something simple like, uh, you know, where's, where's such and such website? You know, how do I get in touch with so-and-so? Um, if you have a question for, for, um, for Sam, because Sam's going to be the focus of the day or for me, but particularly Sam and his topic, uh, put that in the Q and A and, uh, we'll go from there. Um, and that keeps everything nice and organized and I appreciate your guys helping out with that. Um, numbers still growing. I don't want to do Sam's introduction till, uh, till the, till, till it levels off a little bit. Don't want to waste that. <clears throat> no, I'd have to, might have to do it twice. <laughs> <laughs> the sun is out. <clears throat> it's a beautiful day. Probably take another long walk today. Um, go explore my neighborhood some more. Uh, hope everybody's feeling really good. I, I keep running into a lot of people that are super scared or nervous or panicky in it. It just, it doesn't register with me because I'm actually not too worried about the virus. I'm, I'm more concerned with the economy coming back than the virus. And the, even that I'm mildly concerned with, I think it's going to come back fairly well. And I'm also used to the fact that economies have ups and down periods. And so when you have a down period, you can buy low in the stock market and you have an up period, you know, they, they all work off of each other and that's just normal. And, and, um, and so for, for everybody out there that's constantly constantly worrying, just look at your whole life. You spend your whole life worrying about the ups and downs period because you, but you know, you're never going to get away from it. Your life is going to have ups, it's going to have downs, ups and downs. And I just don't want to spend my life worrying. I want to spend my life enjoying myself. And so I've I've I work on even during the down periods, when the economy's down, things are down, feeling uh, really um, really good, and. Um, so were you saying something there to me, Anna, or was that to somebody else? I saw something about the internet. Oh, it was a Jonathan. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Cool. Um, just want to make sure my internet was working good and everything was good. So we've had problems. We're on a different laptop today and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get mine checked out, but, um, but there's no place open. So I have to find a tech and do it online somehow. Okay, let's see, we leveled off. We're at 79, um, still growing a bit, but, uh, but I think I can go ahead and do Sam's introduction and get him started, because um, I think people are gonna trickle in for the next five, 10 minutes. That's the way I, I've noticed you, you, a lot of you guys typically do. You, a lot of them just come in, you know, it's nature. When you got 100 people on a call, you're gonna get a few late. So, um, so this is the second call in the series in the three weeks uh, and uh, 21 days to freedom. And we may continue on, who knows? Um, I'm really enjoying these. They make, they get my day sort of right. Uh, Cause I find every time I get out there and help people and give and pro it just makes the rest of my day that much better. I feel some really good communication with these. Um, uh, I really connect good connection with the audience and it just inspires me. So speaking on the level of inspiration, uh, Sam uh, Pond is, um, is going to be uh, mostly teaching today, and I'm going to be just listening mostly, and I'm going to jump in maybe here and there. But Sam is one of our coaches. He's our newest coach, but, uh, but a very experienced coach. He's got many, many, many years of, uh, of experience in business and success uh, in, all, in, all, in many aspects of life. Now, Sam was a student first, just like all our coaches. Sam came to us. Um, one of the things that I noticed on Sam 
and I tease him about this all the time, was how, uh, how self-abusive he was. His, his internal dialogue, the way you think inside, think about it. Does it beat you up all day long? Does it attack you? Is it hard on you? You have this saying that I've heard so many people say, I'm hard on myself because it motivates me, um, which I call bullshit on. I think you'd be more successful if you weren't hard on yourself. I think that's just an excuse. So there's this, this energy of, of beating ourselves up that we do inside. And I just think that's so destructive to the body, so destructive to your health, so destructive to your mind. And Sam was just inundated in this. And um, what Sam did was nothing short of miraculous. He really shifted his mindset and started learning to talk to himself with self-love. And he's made an art of it and a practice of it. And he's become so good at it. I love hanging out with Sam. In the beginning, it was like, oh, Sam, I can only take so much because he was so negative. And now I can just hang out with him all day. And he just looks at things through his heart. And through, he'll look at the littlest thing through his heart and, and, and play with it and contemplate it. And then the next thing, and you could just see how he's constantly growing and using the 1% rule to just basically become awesome. So, um, so if you haven't seen Sam talk, he, he does a lot of webinars for our private groups. Anybody who's done a workshop gets into this special group and, uh, and Sam does a lot of our vulnerability and he hosts a lot of different webinars in there on vulnerability, different things with Eddie and different students and different coaches. Plus he, um, he's going to be doing more on the channel. I'm sure. Um, he does, he's at every workshop coaching and students love him. He's killing it. So now that's my super long winded introduction, watching the numbers still grow. And, um, and so with no further ado, I'm gonna let Sam jump in here and, uh, and, and take it away. Go for it, man. I think it's really funny. <laughs> it's really funny describing how I was. It was, it was really that self abuse was so baked in, I couldn't even see it. And once I started seeing it, um, my next step was, no, I need this because it's helping me grow, as you said. And then um, from the, and, and I see this in students all and clients all the time. They think the self-abuse is growth. They see it as they're, oh, I'm doing the work. And it's, as you said, it's the farthest thing from doing the work. It just makes everything a struggle. And you can't access all that beautiful upper energy while you're beating yourself up. So... Yeah, it's that addiction to going against the stream. Like I, I know um, Abraham Hicks gives the analogy that everybody's got in their canoe or, or boat trying to paddle upstream when everything they want is downstream, but they're determined to go upstream. And they just keep paddling and paddling. And finally, one day they surrender and go downstream and go, oh, this is so much better. Yeah. So, well, family. you know, and I was, as I was walking, I take walks through my quiet neighborhood. Um, and uh, I noticed that this is such a great, time for this topic because you can feel something in the air that is not anxiety and you can see it even in our efforts to um, you know provide free stuff you, you you see how much free stuff people are offering their coaching their their yoga their workouts anything that's a service even the people who are in the service business are or in the selling business are giving away so we are surrounded by this upwelling of connectedness and and love and you can feel it in the people in the streets that i see while they do give, we give each other kind of a wide berth there's still a hello hellos where and little connections where i'd never sensed them before so it's really good um, yeah i agree with you on that there's a bigger there's more respect for each other out there and mm -hmm. uh, they care um so, take it away i this topic um because it was always a bad habit of mine to try to uh, understand and reach uh, like a cognitive understanding of things. I just want everybody who's on this call to feel something else because this, when we're talking about love, self-acceptance, and any of the courage acceptance piece, these things aren't something you can grab onto and hold. So I just want you to tap into the, it's kind of mysterious, this. So what I'd want everybody to do is to feel along and don't try to understand things. Um, in fact, even in this moment, you can just, just for a moment, just feel your body, feel your, your head trying to understand things and, and grasp, uh, and just feel your body and feel 
you could even just feel where you're you have resistance or you can feel where you have pain or you can re or feel that part of you that's it's open to the messages um, and uh, that's all you really need to do because I realize anytime a guy shows up for a workshop or anytime he shows up on a call like this, this is that action, that choice to be here is, is an expression of faith and love for yourself. So uh, congratulations. Right now I'm actually feeling a little nervous, but I feel really good. Like the nervousness feels kind of good. Like really, I got some energy going out right now. Uh, so where I'll start is, uh, I guess my story, and it's a little, um, I've, I've told my story so many times, and, uh, uh, and to try to encapsulate things in 63 years of, of life uh, is a little confusing, but I'll do my best. I was um, brought up here uh, in uh, San Francisco, and um, my upbringing, we didn't want for anything. My dad was a university professor. My mom uh, was a writer and worked for a newspaper. And everything on the outside seemed really good. Um, we had a nice house, um, large group of friends, but the dynamic within these walls was really different than what was happening on the outside of the walls. My father, who uh, I learned a lot about love from, was a very kind, loving, gentle, emotionally disconnected uh, university professor who would walk around with his uh, glasses on top of his head and ask us where his glasses were. And I must have told him his glasses were on his head 500 times. And then he'd take them off, he'd go, God damn it. And then he'd put them back on. That was the kind of guy he was. He was an absent minded professor. Um, Mom, on the other hand, uh, was um, struggled with, uh, struggled. She was pretty abusive, uh, emotionally, physically, too. Um, everything had to be looking very good on the outside. It was almost like we were trained to believe that we were better than other people, <laughs> where we came up with that. And, and yet, individually, we were worse than other people. So we had this better than, worse than dynamic in the house. So there was always chaos in the house. And um, we all learned to hide from my mom's rages. By the way, I love my mom very much. Um, I always have, and, uh, and we have a really good relationship now. Um, but what that created was, for me, was really was an amazing recipe for being a really nice guy. My, my role in the house was to be the peacemaker. My role was to be the clown, the diplomat. Uh, it's almost like if I had anything going on, uh, inside. I don't share it because I had to take care of my entire family. In fact, I don't think I ever told this story. When I was a kid, like 12 years old, I had this dream, this uh, fever-induced dream. I had a high fever. And my dream was that my entire family was in a helicopter high above the ocean. And that if I didn't keep spinning, like with my arms out, like a helicopter blades, that if I stopped, they would plummet to their deaths. And actually my sister told me later that I came out of my room in a high fever spinning like a hel helicopter. And that's pretty much what it was um, like. So I learned to stuff a lot of stuff down to suppress all kinds of emotions. And I chose to be happy. Um, uh, that nothing would phase me. I didn't share my vulnerability with anybody. Um, and I lived up, uh, like Ryan said, I had successes in life and adventures in life. I had girlfriends. I was always getting my fucking heart broken. Um, and uh, because my, I, actually, they didn't break my heart. My heart was already uh, broken. And I lived with a lot of grief that I had no way of getting in touch with. So love was, was dependent on, on action rather than just being, just having love. I just want to say that was the most insightful statement. My, I'm not getting my heart broken. My heart's already broken. There's so much power in that if you unpack that and what you just said there. So I want to thank you yeah. for that. 
That was a beautifully, beautifully put. Um, yeah. And of course, when I was getting my heart broken by these girls who we all, we had our own dynamic. I, I was very attracted to and was a, attracting um, a broken women. And um, I forgot what I was going to say, something really insightful. Um, so that was my life. And it kind of worked and it kind of worked. And it, I had, you know, uh, I had girlfriends and I, and I got married and that marriage turned after, you know, a while turned into a shit show because we really didn't know what the hell we were doing. We were both kind of this match of two, uh, you know, they say that broke two, two broken halves. We think we, have, we need to make a whole and that this idea of you complete me, this Hollywood bullshit, we just fell into that. And so it was what they call really codependent and disconnected relationship. Um, and what I, what happened to me, and by the way, it was 10 years ago this week, this is interesting that we're talking about this, that after, you know, two careers and a marriage and girlfriends and heartbreaks and travel, all these things that seemed great, my body started to give out on me. And it was really mysterious. I, had to, I went to the hospital two or three times because I was feeling so bad, so much aching, aching in my body and my energy was going up and down. I was getting confused. I couldn't focus on anything. And what was happening was that I was falling into a kind of nervous breakdown where my body knew better than me. My, I was trying to, I was living in my head and doing my best, striving, pushing to be the best of me. It was, it was chaos inside of my body. And then as that happened, it got worse and worse to the point where I was almost blind. And I'll, I'll tell, maybe I'll do a, a webinar to tell the entire story. But basically my whole body shut down. I made frantic phone calls to whoever thought would understand and a voice through the phone. By the way, I was having problems seeing, everything was blurry. And a voice on the phone said, you're talking to the right people, get on a flight tomorrow. We know exactly what's going on. And so I went to this recovery center in the middle of uh, the mountains of, uh, of New Mexico and this is a place that specialized in childhood trauma. And I spent my life thinking I was above it all because my two crazy sisters were at, they need to take care of, my parents need to take care of, that I never let myself feel my own, the effects of my childhood. And it was really powerful. And uh, I remember when I got there, I was really uh, frantic. And uh, the person who led it said, uh, that uh, she grabbed me by the shoulders and said, the man who got you here is the man you are. And that flooded me with emotion. And I, um, and I realized that I had some kind of strength and say in all this. So when I came out of that six weeks later, I was like scrubbed clean. I didn't know who I was, of course the marriage didn't, I'd stopped drinking, by the way, 10 years. I haven't had a drink in 10 years since that moment. I was using that a lot to numb out. And it was this journey to discover something in me. And I tried everything. I tried uh, Buddhist studies, meditation, um, somatics. I, I did landmark, um, uh, life coaching, therapy. I did, every, I did everything. And it all kind of helped. Um, but in, in the, but there was, it wasn't until I started dropping into this world of who am I with women that things started to really crack open. I started to really, really feel. Um, and that was, um, and then by the time I got a couple of years ago, a little over two years ago, working with uh, Brian and Fearless and all the guys that um, I started getting, I read Letting Go and I started went, whoa, there's, I, I've been suppressing all this shit, still suppressing. And then I got to a point where it was okay to feel. And Brian brought up this self-abusive voices. My confusion that by being hard on myself, which was really how I was brought up, 
uh, was the path to growth. And once I started to let go of that, I realized, as Josh told me one day, that <laughs> I think he was frustrated. And he said, all those self-abusive voices uh, in, uh, are their lies. They're just lies. And I realized the truth of that is that I didn't make up these voices. They came from someplace else. And um, so, the, so the drop in into feeling more and into feeling everything and all the grief and all the fear and all the anger that came to the surface was really freeing. So, and that's the access, and that's the path to, to love. Um, and I'll get into that, I'll get into that later. Um, so, this is where I am now. So now I coach guys, I coach guys from, I remember Brian that uh, I was, it was like a year ago and I was, uh, uh, I was assisting and you're talking about, uh, you're talking to the group and he, he said, yeah, like, uh, like Sam here, he keeps, keeps showing up, keeps showing up. And I'm sitting in back kind of laughing. And, and then you said, uh, and you know why he keeps showing up? Now in that moment I said, I'm thinking, yeah, why do I keep showing up? I just, keep showing up to help out. And uh, Brian said, because he loves you guys. And I thought, in that moment, I thought, God, that is so true. I can love people that I don't even know. Like especially love and respect guys who show up in the rooms and to take these courses and to step into a lot of fear and grief so they can be freer. And that deserves uh, a lot of love. So, so coaching is my way of holding space for guys with love and curiosity and hopefully challenge them. And I think that's an interesting practice. Um, it's a beautiful practice. As, and, and I want to ask the audience, just rhetorically, you don't have to answer, but, and then Sam, you'll probably talk, I'm sure you're going to address this, but have you ever walked down the street and practiced just loving people, having an open hearted, warm, endorphin, heartfelt experience for strangers? And just look at them and say, can I love that person? Especially the ones that you least likely think you can love. Can you find that a little bit of love for them? And it's an interesting practice. I, I played with it a little, and I know Sam's done it a lot, too. It's a, in fact, uh, uh, later on, I'll, I'll give uh, some homework to the guys to actually expand on that, that even more. Uh, you can be pretty unreasonable in the amount of love that you cast out into the world. So, um, Another T-shirt, unreasonable love. Unreasonable love offered here. <laughs> okay. There you go. So, um, so there, I don't know when I had this thought, this question in my head, which was, um, what is like, what is love? What is lo what's love? And so I, it hit me one day, I did this little uh, syllogism, which is, okay, on one hand, I've heard that love is abundant. And like, I'm thinking, yeah, 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 I've heard that. Coming from a place of lack of abundance, love was something you had to earn, something you had to work for, something you had to, um, to get, right? But okay, if love is abundant, then if the universe is abundant and uh, timeless and space and, 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 and infinite, that means love is the expanding energy of the universe. And I had that thought, I went, I can feel that. I can feel expansion in the world. Um, I can feel, so, and then I thought, okay, so then if anything that is not expanding is contracting. So anything that is expanding is love and anything that ex ex that's, that's contracting is not love. That gave me some clarity around this. So. I don't have to look for love. I can feel it all, all around me. I can step out of this idea that love is romantic or, 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 uh, or something to be earned. It's just, um, it's beyond a concept. It's more of a feeling of expansion. Um, so anything that expands is love. I like that feeling. That means anything, any expansion in me, anything that feels light is moving up the scale into, into love. So we're talking about self-love, right? Um, that's a really hard one for guys, 
for human beings to feel. Um, well, let's talk what, what, per, what distracts us from feeling love or especially love for yourselves, which is um, all the emotions that we suppress because we don't want to feel them and we'd rather feel joy or we'd rather feel love. And that's actually, there's a striving in that, that, um, and this is what, you know, we all teach, which is when you have st stuff inside of you and it's not allowed any place to expand, which is the power of love, it's going to stay stuck. It's going to stay dark. You're going to have obstacles. You're going to have resistances. And as you bring these feelings to the surface and you start to realize that you can feel these things, and you're still alive. And once you start to feel the grief, the, the, all that stuff, and expands through your body and let them go, which, and Brian's going to be doing a pretty soon, Brian, right? A, a, a webinar on releasing. Yes. Uh, it's really powerful. Um, my practice of releasing really grew when I started dropping into this idea of what love is because I thought, well, we, a lot of guys, mistake guys do when they release emotions is I'm going to release emotion. That means they're trying to get rid of it even before they feel it. So we're talking about welcoming, embracing uh, these things and welcoming and embracing is, um, is love, is way up the scale. So can I, can I give you a quote that uh, you can, it'll add to what you're saying, I think. As a, my teacher, Carl, used to say to us that you can't experience real love unless you're willing to completely have your heart broken wide open. Um, that, you know, and, and, he, and, he's, and he'd let you think about that and sit with that. But there's so much truth in that, right? It's a polarity. Oh. Uh, yeah, and it doesn't make sense. Uh, at first, that doesn't make sense at all. Mm -hmm. um, but as you begin to feel it, um, you know, uh, in the defense, you know, it's um, if you if you're unwilling to have your heart broken wide open, you'll never open it enough to truly experience love. That's right. Yeah, yeah. and so you'll always be guarded a little bit. So you got to drop the guarding completely, and then learn to be okay with the pain. And then the pain does, and the pain goes away, and you experience the love. Yeah, and once you learn to even love your pain, not in a way that oh, this is this is who I am. I'm going to love it and it's going to be part it's a, like that stuck part of me. It's almost like um, releasing for me is from, from the perspective of love or self-love is loving that. It's like that you have these wounded children inside of you and that if you are patient and you sit with, with, with that thing long enough, it becomes safe for that part of you to express itself and come to the surface. Um, it's almost like I had a sensation of releasing is because there's two ways you can release from, you know, your back, from your masculine presence, which is, well, let's say, I'll start there. You start with that loving, that, that nurturing, compassionate uh, side, that the feminine side of you, which says you're here, you're safe, uh, and you don't have to go anywhere. But from the masculine love side, it says it's your presence. You know, good father says, I feel you, I see you, I love you. And when you're ready to go, I'll go with you. Let's go. So you have these two really nice um, uh, uh, dynamics in play when you really start to drop into, into feeling. Um, I had a really interesting release, really powerful release. Uh, I have a, a coach, spiritual coach who practices a lot of the principles that we do, but from more of a spiritual point of view. And I was feeling, uh, God, I had this, I, I was contacted yesterday by a girl who broke my heart 30 years ago. I mean, and that was the whole story. It's a big shit show. Hadn't talked to her in 30 years and all these feelings came back up and underneath the, and so we explored this with sort of a guided release. And I found that there was still a self attack and so I thought, well, what if self-attack is wounded too? And so, I, and so I had this moment where I'm, I thought, I'm going to, what you're saying, Brian, is I thought I am trying to defend myself from the thousand cuts, right? I can feel them in my body. 
And I, for a moment, I thought, you know what? What if I just completely opened my heart and just let him attack me? And because I had an image of a sword. And as soon as I did that, the image of the sword, the sword broke. So powerful. And whoever was wielding the sword slumped in, in grief. And uh, that was being vulnerable to our own emotions is what uh, is, is finding the pain that's inside already that's inside of those emotions. I think that makes sense. <laughs> I think it's beautiful. Uh, the, those metaphorical images, which is, is how the subconscious mind talks. It talks a metaphor and that's what our dreams are doing. Our dreams are taught trying to create these images that represent feelings and emotions we're dealing with. So sometimes the images don't make sense logically. Mm -hmm. You dive deep down inside and explore the feeling that the image is creating. You start to understand what your subconscious mind is trying to process. The dr every dream has a purpose, whether it's predicting your future or, or healing something, uh, venting. And, um, and even when you start to do it consciously like you're doing, using conscious imagery to process emotions it's it's it can sometimes convey one image can convey, convey so much more than a word and then a set then a whole ton of words because that image can be packed full of information for the subconscious mind to process yeah yeah it's not like i even said okay i'm going to create a sword the sword just appeared yes and i was just like okay, i'm going to go with i'm just not going to fight this or call it silly or what are you coming up with images of swords i'm just going to feel the sword yeah um, so, so the path to love is through all of your lower emotions, all these heavier emotions, these contracting emotions. And if you think I'm just going to get to love, well, it's not, you you can feel the push on it and love doesn't push. Love is, it's mysterious. This really is out of, almost out of our control. I've also noticed something. Brian and guys, that once I f started feeling sadness, I started feeling deeper compassion for others, which means there's a gift inside of each lower emotion down the scale. Um, yeah. It's not about getting rid of the lower emotions in the way I look at it and releasing. It's about not making the lower emotions right or wrong, not being averse to them, not being afraid of them and seeing them all as beautiful. And then what happens is maybe you can look, you can walk into sadness, you can experience sadness, you can be in sadness, you can see the beauty of sadness, you can see why it's serving you. And then you can just walk right out of it and go right back to, to love again. Matter of fact, you, while you're in the sadness, you're experiencing love at the same time from that place of being. Absolutely, you can feel the sadness in others. If you can't feel your sadness, you can't feel the sadness in others. And if you can't feel another's sadness, then there's no, yeah. possibility of connecting with that other person yeah it reminds me of cathartic movies uh i had a client once that spent a weekend watching sad movies that made him cry and uh, he watched one after another after another tear jerkers and after the weekend was over he's like oh i feel so much lighter so much better so yeah. were all those movies that were filled with grief and sadness bad or were they healing were they nurturing you know because it was such a disassociated way to do it those were lives on a screen, not his own lives. So there was so much healing in that. I've been watching the movies that, I keep a list of movies that may help me feel. Uh, yesterday was, um, last night was, uh, two nights ago was Whale Rider. Oh, uh, let's put a, if let's you have not seen Whale Rider, you gotta see it. But we gotta put a list of these together somewhere. All these movies that make us feel, I wanna watch, I'll watch them all. So if you Whale Rider's one, let's, let's create a list somewhere. Um, I have, I'll, I'll, I'll I've been putting them on the family page of shoving them down guys' throats. But last night I watched Inside Out, Disney Pixar movie about- uh, Cartoon, right? It's a car yeah, yeah, it's an animated movie about what if all the emotions uh, were, were inside of our heads and they were little characters. And it's a really brilliant movie. People keep telling me to watch that. Um, I'll give you one more, it's a tearjerker. Anthony saw it with me, it was um, Hostels. Not to be confused with Hostel. The, the, there's Hostel, which is that series of movies where they chain people to whatever. You know? But yeah. Hostels is an amazing uh, Western. So sad, so much grief, so deep. I don't know, did you, have you seen that one, Sam? Yes, I have. Yeah, powerful film. 
Yeah, and any and the, the and the thing about a great movie that helps you feel is that it introduces you to a feeling that you already have inside of you. Um, and uh, if you've never seen um, the Intouchables, not the Untouchables, Intouchables, uh, that's a beautiful movie about friendship between a billionaire who hires a, a thug off the street to be his. He's a quadriplegic to to help be his body man. And their their relationship and how they is beautiful movie about love and no pity. They don't pity each other. They it's just great. Um, the other one and I just cry all the time. I cry at movies. So I'm watching Inside Out. Sam, can you do us a favor after this is over? Can you make a list of all these films and what emotions you think they kind of bring up and put it on the put it out there to the to the different pages? Absolutely. Are, that's what people are asking for right now in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the chat. They're saying, hey, can you make a list of these movies so we can go watch them? Absolutely. Yeah, I have my list, uh, my list uh, running. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I'm a softie. Um, Whale Rider. Wow, that's uh, a, a Maori chief in modern day New Zealand is seeing his community uh, crumble to drugs and uh, he's looking for the next chief. And he doesn't see that the next chief is his granddaughter, and uh, who in the it's just the most moving movie you've ever seen. It's amazing. Um, oh wait, okay, wait. So inside out, you've got Joy is trying to run the show. Happy, 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 and she's trying to keep sadness, the character sadness, at bay. In fact, there's moments where she says she draws a circle and says, "You cannot go outside of the circle." The movie takes us, the, the girl is actually falling in depression because her family moves. There's a hole. And here's Joy frantically trying to keep sadness at bay. And it wasn't until then the girl is, um, have, you know, gets on a bus and tries to run away. And finally, Joy lets uh, sadness do a little something. And suddenly, the girl wakes up from her numbed, running away state and starts crying. That sadness had the power to have, get her off the bus, say stop the bus and get her back to her parents. And her parents say, they were like, where, where have you been? This is where Joy finally completely surrenders and says, you take it from here, sadness. And when sadness takes over inside of her brain and her body, she starts crying and really sobbing. And the pain of her vulnerability brings the family together. It's the most it's very powerful. So our connection to our sadness is our connection to other human beings. Yeah, that's fascinating because in the releasing model, what you would say is she kept telling herself she was in joy, but in reality, she was in apathy. Yeah, and oh, yes. Yeah, and she was saying, nope, I'm happy, I'm happy, that, that kind of insane response people give. My life's great. And then, um, and, uh, and to get out of the apathy, she had to experience the sadness to get to true joy. True joy was going through the emotions, not around them and, or denying them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, she was just frantically keeping it at bay. And that, that's actually the structure of the movie is the girl falling into apathy, falling deeper. And it's almost like I never realized the movie actually was a Disney Pixar movie about depression. Um, and it wasn't until sadness and joy. And so now you get joy isn't real without a little sadness. And I think we can all feel when we uh, are overwhelmed by emotion and it's not exactly sadness, that's not exactly joy. It's just something that's welling up from inside. Um, that's that kind of magical place. Um, I also thought I was doing some research on what, um, you know, as you make your way up that the, the emotional chart from apathy up to peace and acceptance and courage, I started thinking, well, where does love, that love is not on the chart of emotions, technically speaking, it says peace. And we said, well, maybe peace is love. But if you look at the top three, the cap emotions, courage, acceptance, peace, those really are that's where love, this just sense of a love place of being is. It exists across all three of them. 
of you. And also if you look in ha Hawkins book, he puts love right between acceptance and peace. Um, mm -hmm. And if you look in acceptance, there's loving and acceptance and loving and courage. So you're right. Loving is in basically all those emotions. And when you're fully experiencing love, love and courage, love and acceptance, love and, and, and right, and then love fully takes over beyond acceptance, then what's left but peace? Yeah, right. I feel that. And then I, and then I, was, I, I was researching, um, you know, oh, by the way, that means that every, that true love or courage, acceptance, peace, is made up of all the emotions. It's, you just can't get there without by skipping everything. It's like the color white. So I researched white. White is the, it's actually not on the spectrum, technically, uh, because it's a combination of all, of all co uh, colors as it exists in light, which means that blackness is the, Devoid, it's devoid of, of uh, it's all colors condensed in a contracting space. So anything that starts, again, this goes back to this feeling of abundance, where you can feel a little bit of this expansion where all emotions are accepted and flowing together, then you're, that's the pathway to love and certainly the path, pathway to self-love. Yeah, that comes back to the day I realized every, people would tell me they couldn't feel. They'd say, I can't feel, I can't feel, I feel nothing. And I came to the realization one day that's impossible, that we're always feeling. And that if you're not feeling, it's not the lack of feeling, it's the overload of feeling, too much feeling, to the point of, of, of the circuit breaker, like on a circuit breaker panel, got too much electricity and shut down, pop. And, or, and, and it just became so much, kind of like a, a giant spin that, that turned into numbness, that it overloaded your senses. Yeah. So, and then the, the getting that back into a proper balance, a proper flow state is when you start feeling again. Yeah, it's amazing when you all, when, when it's like they're, they're all glued together down there. And once they're released and they start to flow together, then they, the same emotions create courage, acceptance, peace, and love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There, there is no, there is no, it's like, it's like, when you let it completely flow, it's like a hose unkinked and everything flows just perfectly. And, and when you start kinking it, then that all builds up. And it's that buildup that causes the pressure in the hose because the water can't get through and to the point where it's just stuck and that creates the numbness wow. and, and the complete shutdown. And, um, and that's, what we're, that's what we're cleaning out. We're, letting, we're getting back to that full flow again. I noticed in my life this, and you might notice this too. I've been talking about this lately, Sam, a lot. And I'm going to do a class on this is I was really good as a codependent at giving away and helping and supporting others a lot. And uh, I was constantly doing it, but what I wasn't doing was playing the other end of the hose enough, the spigot. I wasn't allowing enough in. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the day, at the end of a workshop, I'd be beat up. My muscles would hurt. I'd be so sore because I wasn't letting energy come back in to replace the energy that was going out. I wasn't creating a circuit. I was experiencing the exact same thing last week. And I had a big realization that I was putting a lot of love and service into the world, you know, because everything was happening so quickly last week and I wasn't allowing in, I wasn't receiving. And uh, I wasn't willing to learn from my, uh, my connection with other people or clients or what can they offer me? How does it flow back and forth? Um, that was powerful. Yeah, it's very powerful. Pushing on the world. Uh, let's take a few questions. Hey, Philip. Hey, um, um, Eric Plum wrote, uh, he really should have put love between courage and acceptance. So it's spelled clap. <laughs> I get it. I saw that help doesn't really, isn't a good acronym. Courage, acceptance, love, peace. But <laughs> clap. I saw that too. And I got the clap. I my I eyes clap. I saw it was Eric Plum. <laughs> Come on, Eric. You can tell everybody I got the clap. Yay. <laughs> so Philip writes, um, Sam, I started your I love you meditation every day and wanted to ask you, what did you specifically, what did you specifically when some resistance came up, what did you do specifically? Maybe for me, it was there were some sentences like that's not true. This is great. I'm glad you asked that question because I don't know if we have time on the call, but 
I do have, and we can all try it. And if, for me, it's nightly. Before I go to bed, I soak myself in with whatever love I can feel in myself at that moment. Not like I'm going to look at myself and say, I love you, come on, F feel that love. And I just soak myself and I, I will tell my love you to, if I can feel my face tight, I just say, I love you, I just love you. I like, just feel it silently to myself in a very sing-songy way. And then I can feel my body start to relax, relax and soak up all this expanding energy in my body. Um, I fall asleep usually within, I have no idea, I just fall asleep. Um, it's really powerful. So this is something we can all do. And so Philip asks, what do you do when you have resistance? You can love the resistance. You can love the shame or the embarrassment or the, or the grief that comes in. You can just, why not just love, send love to everything and let that love go inside of your grief or your fear or your anger and just let it, let that expand. Um, it's a great opportunity to, you know, uh, Matt Kahn is a, a writer and spiritual teacher, wrote a book called Whatever Arises, Love That. And he suggests doing the most unreasonable love practices in the world to yourself. Um, so it's a great opportunity to, to love and, and, and release what's going on. And we'll be discussing this during the releasing seminar, but that's the basis of releasing. That's, that's how it all started. Releasing started with the idea that Lester Levinson was going to learn to give away love to everything, no matter what it was. And he practiced understanding love first, and then he started changing everything to love a little bit at a time. Um, and I think that's the most powerful practice there is, pretty much. I was, when I was uh, talking in uh, that Amirati thing, I did a, a group uh, meditation on saying I love you to your own heart. And um, a lot of guys were doing it. A lot of guys were feeling down in their bodies and, you know, feeling, because it's like your subconscious doesn't really know what's real and it really knows what it's fed, right? So you could try an experiment in just feeding your own heart love. And it was going interestingly until I shifted up and I shifted the meditation to be I don't know how to love myself. I looked up and three guys were crying. Mm -hmm. And that sensitivity, that's, uh, is, you, uh, that it's like a little bit of compassion or empathy, self-empathy for yourself and your own wounds. And even the tears that might come up from the feeling of not knowing how to love yourself is very, very opening. Yeah, that's the pathway to love. Because part of it is accepting what is, which then allows you to, because the removal of, uh, of uh, creating more understanding and the removal of uncertainty, like being able to look at something for what it is, is what creates clarity, which then allows you to be able to shift the energy. Yeah. And so most of us go into resistance and what you're saying and it's a core aspect, again, we're alluding in every video to a lot of releasing, is the welcoming of what is, even if it's apathy, and not making the apathy wrong or right. It's just, it's just apathy. I was working with a guy in the experience a few weeks ago, and he was looking really sad in front of the models, and, he, and I just had him say, I feel, say, I feel sad. And he said, I feel sad. And he got a little sadder, and it wasn't until I asked him to say, I don't want to feel sad, is right. when he burst into tears. You nailed it. You nailed it. That's, that's exactly where so much of us are. In, we've mastered resistance as a human species. Yeah. Internal yeah. resistance. Yeah. I'm, sure. I'm going to read these questions to you if you don't mind. Because mm -hmm. uh, then I'm going to let you contemplate them. And I, find, I don't know. So tell me if that works better for you. But um, Let's do it. Daniel. Daniel's the next one. Hi, guys. Love you all. Brian, can you recommend? Oh, I'm going I'm to give this to you first. And we'll, so we'll go from there. Brian, can you recommend any specific ways of how to get rid of the numbness and resistance in the penis when you are together with a woman. My cock gets very numb. Well, you gotta love your penis. <laughs> <laughs> you do. <laughs> uh, I, that's basically it, you know. Um, releasing on, and, and here's the key to stuff like that. Uh, I used to be the same way a long time ago, and. 
the key is to not just the penis, but the whole area down here in the, in the, in the hip area, you got to do releasing on. So all down here, all through here, so touch it and feel any numbness, tightness, release, because the energy moves down the front of the body into the groin and back up the back. So if you're just releasing on the penis, you're not releasing on the part of the body. Like you could be tightening in the stomach right here. It's pulling that energy up. So you got to release that whole area. So welcoming, letting go. And, and again, the practice moving and rotating hips and then welcoming and releasing, moving them in different directions. So the practice would be to do uh, releasing for a minimum of 10 minutes, doing maybe one form of movement, whether you're rotating the hips this way or this way, and exploring the whole area. Any feeling you get, you welcome it. Any tingles, any resistance you get, you welcome it. And you just keep welcoming. And then every once in a while, when you've got comfortable with a new level of welcoming, ask for a release. And we'll cover this in the releasing. And with time, you'll start feeling more down there. And don't try to look for growth in feeling for at least a week, maybe two. Just do the practice. And you may bust into tears. I remember one time I was doing hip rotations and for 10 minutes straight, and at 10 minute mark, I busted into tears that just lasted for a while. And nothing, it, just, it was just coming out of me. And then boom, I relaxed and I could feel more down there again. So that's a super short answer, Daniel. Um, but we can get, you'll, you'll understand it better as we get into the releasing work. Did you want to say any more, Sam? No, that's great. I was looking towards I'm, the next question is a really juicy one. Can you read it out loud? I just read it. Okay. It's from Nick. Hi, Brian. Love your content and message. I have a friend who's been in a dark place for a long time, but I'm not sure how to help him. He's so apathetic and he shoots everything down with negativity. How can you help someone who says they want to change but really doesn't? Go for it, Sam. This is right up your alley. Yeah. Um, you can feel the little bit, you can feel the love and concern in the question, but can you also feel there's a little push in it too. The wanting to help another person is beautiful. But, you know, I had a big lesson a few years ago when I realized that, first of all, there's always going to be resistance from someone who doesn't want to change and you wanting to change them just creates more resistance uh, or wanting to help someone who doesn't actually want help. That's why advice feels so bad. Unasked for advice feels bad and it actually hardens the wall between you and the other person. The most powerful thing I learned was just when you f have a friend, someone you're concerned about, the world to just say and feel, I get it, I understand. That's what he really wants to hear. All the trying to change them, giving them advice and how do you help, it, it can't, until you plant a, like the fertile ground of trust and understanding and love, then, you, then anything you're gonna to try to do for them is gonna be resisted. So feel your own compassion for them. Feel your, not sympathy. Sympathy is needy. Not like, it's like, oh, this poor guy. No, compassion is, God, look at this human being. Feel him, ask him questions, be curious about him. That's the pathway to actually helping someone. That's the first step. And would you say that he, you can't drop to his level of, because a lot of people will do that, but then they drop to that person's level of emotional, their emotional state. They get sad with them. What yeah. would you say to that? Happens all the time. Um, it, I've seen it. The other part is maybe it's more me is that, oh, come on, don't be that way. Let's go. And that's equally as, uh, so there's resistance in both. Yeah. So, not actually accepting the what is. So you got to stay in an open place, even though they're heavy, and then keep modeling it until they, to, over time, it might take weeks, start to come up and ask you how, how, you, how you stay in that place. Yeah. Yeah. So you're demonstrating it more than telling it. 100%. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that what you want him to feel for himself, love and acceptance and curiosity and peace, can you bring that to him? So he can feel it. That's the modeling, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, you ready for the next one? Yeah, we got 20 questions here. So we're coming going. in, coming in a little bit of time. Hey, fearless team, question for Brian. Um, and I'm, I'm going to throw this to you unless I have to jump in here or there's something you, we need to play with. What are your thoughts on masturbation and porn? 
I try to limit porn because it can be bad psychologically and masturbation to keep testosterone on a healthy level. I'm going to hand that one to you, Brian. I'm, I'm in the love world here. So, uh, yeah. um, porn, uh, porn addiction is really not good because you are projecting onto the well, I, This is a long talk I do, but so I don't want to get into the long talk, but porn addiction is bad because what you're doing is, is you're not having any intimate connection or love or heart connection with the person on the screen. And what happens is, is you can break up with a girl in a second in the sense that you can look at one girl, don't like her, go to the next, go to the next, go to the next. And your mind doesn't know the difference between imagined and real. So it gets confused by this. And you're also projecting into an alternate reality that isn't real in the physical reality. So you're actually pushing women away from you. A lot of guys who masturbate a lot because the mind, as far as it's concerned, uh, you're getting all the women you need from porn. Um, so, um, so there's this idea with porn of, um, of projection and, 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 and this idea of, I don't have to have any real connection. I, I, I don't have to deal with real emotions. When you meet a real woman in the real world, you have to connect, you have to listen, you have to be there for her. as much as you like her sexually, you also have to be there from the heart. So both energies are at play. With porn, you don't have to be there from the heart. You can just be completely in turn on and, and then move from one girl to the next. It doesn't, and what it does, it creates a, an unrealistic standard for real life and, dis and disconnection from, and the ability to connect to women gets harder and harder because you can't, can't relate to real women because of the porn, if you're addicted. Now, if you just watch it occasionally and you have fun with it and you laugh at it, no big deal. Just like anything else, an occasional beer is no big deal. Um, and uh, that's basically my opinion. I also think that a uh, certain amount of semen retention, I don't think 100% like the Taoists say, but I think a certain amount of semen retention not coming is, is really good. I think be, and learning to run that energy through your body and learning to feel the endorphins flood your body rather than ejaculation is super healthy for the male body. It also makes you better sexually, makes, gives you more pleasure, creates more stamina. Uh, you'll reach the point where uh, you don't even need to always ejaculate during sex. You can actually get a sense of an internal orgasm that feels really good. Um, and that's super, and, and you'll actually get out of bed with more energy than you went in because of that wake up of the body when you do that. Um, and, um, and that can be really good if you want to cultivate that. It's quite a practice to cultivate that, but uh, it's super healthy for both you and your partner. Um, and it, and it allows you to be multi-orgasmic like a woman potentially can be. And that's great too. And then you can take all that beautiful creative energy you cultivate from not ejaculating and put it into art. You can put it into your business. You can put it into all kinds of stuff. We have a whole workshop that, where we talk a lot about this set called sexual transmutation. Um, and uh, the whole Napoleon Hill concept of how you transmute sex into things or, uh, and it, it goes beyond Napoleon Hill. I mean, I'm saying him, but if you go back to the Dallas and the tantrics, it, that the sexual energy is creative energy. It creates a baby, it can create business, it can create art, it can create so much. And when you infuse the sex, the love, the heart that Sam's talking about with the sexual energy, mm -hmm. you, you're unstoppable. The, the ability to manifest goes through the roof because you have control of those channels and you can direct them in the form now rather than just wasting them on that on other stuff, you know, just constantly on porn, getting rid of all that creative energy because you can't, basically the reason we're doing it is we can't stand the buildup. The less you masturbate, the more you feel. And the more you have to channel that energy that builds up into, into form and into things and into function. And if, we, and if we don't believe in ourselves or we don't want to do something or we have a negative self reality, we want to constantly get rid of that energy so we feel less. Um, now that's not to say ejaculation is bad. I think ejaculation once in a while is great for the body, but when you're doing it constantly and artificially, yeah, it's not good. I think it's like anything is that we go back to it. Is there, when you do look at porn or masturbate, do you feel contracting energy or do you feel expanding energy? And it could be expanding energy, light and fun and playful. And, um, it's just like that is to me is the little equation that I carry around. Is this growing and expanding and loosening or is this pulling me down tighter? Yeah. I, I don't have a problem with porn as long, as long as it's not uh, chronic and constant. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, it's like an occasional thing.
All right, I'll read the next question to you. Can you tell me a difference between Eastern women and Western women? I live in Eastern culture because in my country, they don't walk so much on the street. They're wary towards being approached, especially on the street. Hope to hear your opinion about this. You know, uh, I have a thought. Let me, I'll, I have a thought. I think by Eastern though, he means the Asian culture, right? Asian culture, yeah. That we are brainwashed by, well, our, our parents and our society and our religions and our, and our cultures, right? So you, if that's how you see your world, whether it's true or not, you are seeing them from the exact same culture as they are, and they are experiencing. So can you start to open yourself up and be up? It's all about you and your reality. If you see women walking around closed, while well, that might be kind of true, how you approach them, if you're coming to them from the same closed space, that's what you're going to create and that's what you're going to see. And I'll just say that I haven't spent a lot of time in too many Eastern cultures other than Japan. And I find Japanese women um, to be super approachable. Uh, they giggle, they laugh, they get embarrassed, they have fun. Um, I find that more than some Chinese women and stuff like that. But ultimately, um, I believe that there's guys that have approached women in pretty much <clears throat> most cultures. So, <clears throat> um, so does anybody on the panel have experience in an Asian culture that besides Japan? Because women at the core are women. I mean, they have the same, just like men are men at the core. We have a lot of this similar programming. Yes, maybe the culture is taught more repression, be careful, pull back. And depending on how embedded that is in the culture, you could have more of a challenge. But I believe that wherever there's a desire, there's a way. So I believe that in modern society, any, any Asian culture that's got somewhat of a modern society, there's a way around it. There's a way to approach to be a little different. I'll give you an example. When I was in um, Ukraine and I was walking up to some women on the street, um, I noticed there's a stronger polarity there between the male and the female than other places. So there's this real, you be man, I'm female. And so I found being more, way more direct than usual walking up to a girl on the street worked a lot better. So being really bold and forward and say, and, and then simple sentences because they don't speak a lot of English there. So, you know, I walking up, say, hi, you, me, we get coffee now, or we get coffee. And then they're like, and then you kind of watch the response and you're very forward, which is not something I would be normally somewhere else. And then typically sometimes I say, oh, I'm busy right now, not now. And I'm, I'd be like, no, I don't mean now. I mean later. Let's talk. And then you start coming down. It's that bold approach and then relax into a connection. And um, worked better there. And my friend figured that out. And he showed it to me. And, and uh, But, you know, as I change and believe more and more, as Sam said, that it can work, it typically starts working. The more I feel it working, have the belief it's going to work, the opportunities show up. So... It's the best answer I've got right now for that one. Let me, uh, I'm going to go on to Boris. I'm going to go on to Boris. Hello, Sam. This one's for you. Could you tell something about uh, practicing a uh, game? Could you tell us something about practicing game? Even if a dude is, an anti, uh, is on antidepressants for severe anxiety and panic attacks. Okay, so I'm going to read that again. Hello, Sam. Could you tell, uh, tell us something about practicing game, even if a dude is on antidepressants or, or having severe uh, anxiety and panic attacks? Is it recommended or not? Is there anyone that was uh, your student in that situation? How did it turn out? Thanks. Wow, well, we've seen guys who, aside from the label of depressed or anxious, um, we're not, you know, we're not medical doctors but we've certainly seen a lot of guys in a very depressed, apathetic states, uh, which could be, um, it could be a depressed state. Uh, and we've seen a lot of guys with a high level anxiety. Um, the question might be about whether to take antidepressants. Um, I'm not a doctor, I can't, I can't speak to that. Um, I know they're of successful, people have taken successfully. Most people I know have taken, have try to get off them as fast as possible because it numbs them out and they don't feel alive anymore. Really, they just feel dead inside. Um, boy, I tell you, we've, I mean, 
we, you've seen every kind of depression, right? Every kind of apathy, every kind of anxiety. I've seen tons of it. And I don't have a problem with antidepressants for somebody who needs them. If you're, if you're under a doctor's care and you need the antidepressants, and uh, especially if you're, if you're having really negative, dark thoughts uh, and you need to be on them, be on them. But you, and, and maybe in that case, you want to consult your doctor uh, as you do the work. But the more you do the work and grow, the quicker you can get off of them um, and potentially with your doctor's advice. And I'm all about that. Uh, I've taken, you know, in the past, I've taken some, some antidepressants when I was younger, didn't stay on them very long. So I didn't see, I didn't feel like it did much. Um, that was my personal choice. I also took uh, Ritalin for a bit and then got off of it. Um, I saw the a huge effect on the Ritalin, but the Ritalin, um, I realized was artificial. So I wanted to get off it and figure out how to recultivate that level of focus and drive without the Ritalin. That was my choice again. Um, but I always recommend, and, and we have to legally. So, you know, you need to consult the, the medical professional that put you on it before you make any changes to your medication. Um, that said, though, we have seen guys come in in extremely numbed out cases where there was one guy okay. with a crime scene investigator. He had no color. He had literally, his skin was gray. Yeah. And then, watched him over three days come to life and get color and a personality. That's, yep. It was his, you know, moving up that chart of letting him feel outside of his apathy and it brought him to life. Yeah, I've seen people talk, like we'll put them in certain areas where they'll talk and, and you can see they have no expression in their voice anymore. There's no inflection to intonation. And through the work that all comes back to life and their heart turns on and they get so much happier. And it can be a little rough ride coming, turning back on when you've turned off. But um, once you get there, it feels so much better. So good. Okay, let's continue on. Uh, okay. Anonymous okay. attendee. Uh, I've grown very resentful of some people when they trigger certain behaviors in me that I don't like about myself. What's the first step one can take or just to start to love people or feel the expanding feeling? Thank you. You know, you, you touched on it earlier, Brian, about can you walk around and invite whatever feeling of love or compassion you have for anyone, how they, cause there's reactivity in this question. <clears throat> they make me do this, which means you aren't owning your own world. There's a, like a little bit of blame. If you can feel the blame that you're putting on that other person, that has nothing to do with them. There are people who trigger the shit out of me still, but there are two sides to it. One is, wait a minute, they're not, they have no responsible for my internal world. This is my world. This is how I'm just reacting to it. So that's a gift for me. And the other side of it is if they're doing something, you know, pushing on you from anger or pushing on you, uh, whatever they're doing, that means they're struggling with something too. So if in that moment you can pause and feel that, as I said before, that sense of, I understand, you'd be amazed how quickly things soften and how their behaviors start to change because your internal world towards them has changed. So you're actually creating your own reality. Beautiful answer. Um, I think at the core of all that is realizing that every human being is a vulnerable person and ultimately just wants to experience love. No matter how dark they are, if you could get past all the darkness and the heaviness and the disconnection from their humanity, at the core, they just want to be loved and give love, and they don't know how to do it, so they, they, they get farther and farther away from that till the point they're so far away from it, it just, they, they, they get angry, they fight, they get dark, they get, and it's that journey back for them that could be so rough. Yeah. And so when you can see that everybody at their core just wants to be loved, then you can start to love everybody no matter how difficult they're being. And sometimes it's a challenge. You know, they're gonna push you to your limits because that's, they're gonna find that little crevice inside you where you're not loving and show it to you, especially if you're on the path to learn to love everybody. Yeah. One after another. Okay. Um, Dan, assholes don't deserve it. Assholes don't. Being reactive. <laughs> Every, I'm going to love everybody but the assholes. But the assholes. <laughs> okay, Daniel, can you talk more about not making the lower emotions right or wrong? I'll let you do that. Well, 
that's kind of a, well, it, I understand this question really well because they don't feel good in the moment. So anything that doesn't feel good is going to, we're going to judge it as right or wrong. It, for me, it was a constant reminder that there is nothing wrong with being sad, even though it hurts. That, and that under, and then that feeling, because you can, it's, it depends. If you identify 100% with your grief, then that's where you're going to stay. But if you can start to develop a practice of being this um, loving observer to what's going on in your body from a place of whatever courage, peace, acceptance, or love that you can just discover, even a, a hint, that's going to start, you're going to, because your lower emotions are like that, that, you know, from the previous question, that's a, someone that's just pushing on you, it just deserves some to be felt. Beautifully said. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I, I look at that on almost every release I do. I ask, am I judging this is right or wrong? Am I making this good or bad? And then I, and I just watch it for a little bit. And I don't even try to stop it at first. I just welcome it like you talked about earlier, Sam. Yeah. And that's, that in and of itself has a huge effect on allowing you to let go of it. Um, another one, um, this one's interesting and uh, because we kind of cover, we, we've talked about it, we've been talking about it more recently. How to get rid of anxiety of feeling a woman emotionally. How to learn to let women in emotionally without feeling drained. Hmm. You want to start on that one? I've got some ideas rumbling here. Sure. Um, I've been doing recently a practice of letting the feminine feed my body every day. Like the feminine, I do a meditation for 10 minutes where I welcome feminine energy in all its forms, not just women. Could be a flower, could be anything that's emotionally expressive or expressive or has feeling to it, and letting it feed my body, letting it imagining the feminine wants to dance for the masculine, the feminine wants to feed the masculine because the masculine is the riverbed, the feminine is the river, so the feminine wants to flow over the masculine. So, for 10 minutes every day, just this looking around and seeing the beauty in the world. And if you do that every day for a week, you'll probably start feeling all kinds of stuff. Uh, what you think is letting it is getting drained by women is actually not getting drained. It's getting drained by the resistance to letting women feed you. Like, like the hose is kinking off because it's afraid of the water, but the water is the very thing the hose needs to feel full. And so because the hose is kinking off because it's afraid of the water, it feels drained and it's blaming the water. That's what, that's what's going on there. So if you do this practice, you can start letting in, feminine energy, which is the very energy as a man that inspires you to go out and conquer the world. Or as a also, I was made aware that um, uh, several months ago that someone asked, do, when you give a hug, do you feel yourself hugging or do you feel the hug? It was a, I went, oh shit, I only feel me hugging them and not that sense of someone's arms being around me and being able to relax into that. You're that receiving them in. Receiving. Yeah. So many men that work with us because your nice guys are terrible receivers. And that's what this works on this ability to hug and let somebody in this ability to sit and just let the feminine feed you. Um, and then you don't have any energy to go out and conquer the world and get shit done. And then you wonder why. Look at the most successful personal growth gurus in the world. They typically have a feminine partner if they're masculine and vice versa that inspires them like the Bob Proctors of the world, you know, that drives them to the next level. And, um, and Zig Ziglar, and he always talks about the redhead, you know, and, and how, and t together they're unstoppable. So, uh, and to that, if, uh, whoever wrote that question, uh, Daniel read, uh, the alabaster girl by Zan Perion, and you'll learn about how women can feed you. Yeah. Great and do, do, and I haven't done this. I might start doing this. I might start rereading some of the alabaster girl but I'll do that 10 minute meditation first where I practice just letting as much feminine in, then read the book. Why? And so I can fully let the words in. Um, be yeah, an interesting practice. Okay. Next one. Uh, Sonnet. Uh, I can't feel my sadness or grief. Many people have told, uh, have told plain told. Okay. The mystery up there. Many people have plain told me that I look sad and angry all the time. How do I feel my grief? I have had a lot of childhood emotional abuse. 
one place you could start is stop trying to feel the emotion of grief or anger. And because a, a, an emotion is just a concept that we put around a feeling. So one place is to, you could just start feeling where your body feels what you're calling sadness or anger. You could really just start and you, it'll be, it's like a really mysterious practice of curio deep curiosity and what's happening in your body. For me, I feel fear. When I feel fear, it's always in my stomach. I can feel tightness. When I'm feeling locked out from the world, I can feel a tightness around my chest. That would be, a, for me, it would be a great place to start. Nice. Okay, I'm gonna start going through these a little faster, see if we can get as many done as we can. If we don't do any releasing and do three approaches per day, is it going to work besides all the new programming you're giving us? Is it going to work besides all the new, I'm not sure what he means by that. If you don't do any releasing and do three approaches per day, is it going to work besides all the programming, the new programming you're giving us? I don't know if you understand, fully understand that question, but let's give it a shot and answer it as best as you can. I, I think he's just asking if you do approaches without doing any releasing, does it work? Yeah, and I didn't get the part about besides all the new programming you're giving us. Uh, but yeah, go, go for that, answer that part of the question. Um, it, what, it, it sounds like there's re resistance to the releasing part of this, which is fine. You don't have to release, you can just approach somebody and take a pause in between and say, just ask yourself, what am I feeling? And, and accept it and let it expand in you and find the power. If you're nervous, you're still nervous, say, what, what's, the, what's the power in this nervousness? What's the gift here? You're not trying to stuff it down and say, okay, I've heard that I should be confident and I'm just gonna move ahead. Well, you're just gonna run into brick walls that way time after time. So really, it doesn't have to be a big deal. Just feel for a little while. I think it's a great answer. And um, it's just the key here is, is don't stuff it down because that's how you grow. You grow through the feeling. You don't grow through the, the if you just approach and stuff down, you're probably going to get more walled off and more walled off. And five years from now, you'll still be approaching and wondering why women aren't responding. But if you approach to grow, not the intent to get women, but to grow and feel more confident with each approach through the feeling process he just talked about, then then um, you'll, you'll be on the right path. Um, which books can I read or what videos can I watch? Uh, how can I start with the practice to love everything in my life? <laughs> I, when I started watching uh, Matt Kahn's videos, K-A-H-N, uh, he's the guy who wrote the book, uh, Whatever Arises, Love That, and he has a wonderful video called The Love Revolution on um, YouTube. Uh, it's completely re unreasonable. It's almost silly. It's almost embarrassing to watch, but it, it's, uh, he really believes in the power of love. That's, that's one that rises, comes to mind right now. I love that. And uh, why I love that is because I love the whole idea of radical acceptance, this idea that mm -hmm. I am ex imagining that I have created every single thing that happens to me, even if it seems totally ridiculous. You know, same basic idea. I'm walking down the street and somebody throws a tomato at me from a car window. Did I create that? Yep, that's how I act, you know. And it may piss me off, I may get mad at them, doesn't mean I don't follow up legally, get stuff taken care of, whatever I have to do. But inside I say, how did I create that? Now, maybe I did, maybe I didn't, we can't prove that scientifically. But what that does, it gives me a certain sense of power over reality and allows me to create a better and better reality every year because I get 1% better, 1% better at choosing my reality. And I've noticed a huge difference in my life when I do that. Now, I'm not saying that's 100% true. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But it sure serves me when I do that. You know, Matt, uh, I was gonna give this at the end, but this is a good time to talk about it, is Matt Kahn has a, uh, a practice which he calls the Jim Carrey batshit crazy, completely unreasonable love for everything that you see. And I did it for a week. I walked around the streets going, God, look at you, tree. I love you. Oh, the fire hydrant. God. And I'm saying it out loud. I'm thinking it. And after three days of this, I started getting giddy. It's like I felt this energy. Even though there was embarrassment and, and resistance, I just pushed through. And it came to a moment where I tripped on a crack in the sidewalk. And you know when you trip a, a crack in the sidewalk, you look at the crack and you go, God, it's a crack or other people, if, if, you know, it wasn't my fault, everybody, the crack in the sidewalk. I tripped on the crack of the sidewalk 
I felt the resistance and I turned to the crack and out loud I said, God, I love you, crack. Thank you so much for waking me up. I don't know what, what gift you just gave me, but I can feel pain in my toe. And I thought, I, I thought okay, now I'm insane. But I feel light. So I want everybody to go out, at least, even walking around your house, just walk around saying, finding love for absolutely everything. And it may just, it'll feel a little insane and embarrassing and stupid, but it's kind of exciting. <laughs> I, I agree 100%. I think it's awesome. Yeah. Um, give it a shot, guys. This is another great practice. If you're inclined to one of these practices, do them. Uh, I recently, it, you made me think of how I recently broke my toe with the, with the, the bar. I dropped a weight yeah. bar on it, broke my toe. And, and, and you know, obviously I, I let go of the bar and did that. Um, and then I went to the doctor and I had a blast at the doctor. I, I was joking with this doctor and flirting with her and we had this great conversation, talked all uh, for, for like an hour about all kinds of nutritional stuff. And I got inspired by this, these integrative medicine doctors are showing up everywhere in my life that love Eastern medicine. And then I went home thinking, wow, that was a lot of fun. And I've been back there like three times since. And I realized the whole staff is like that at this place. And then I met another doctor and asked her out on a date and I was flirting with her. And I was like, and I've had so much fun with this broken toe because I'm not, I, cause I didn't make it wrong. I just right. made it the thing that happened to me and laughed. And by the way, if anybody, I, I just typed my um, email in the, uh, in the chat. If anybody wants to talk about any of these practices, uh, um, hit me up and, and we can talk. There you go. See, that's an offer, guys. Don't, you know, take it, take it while it lasts. Okay, we got Sean Corleone. Corleone. Uh, more times than, I, than not, I can feel myself tensing up in some places. But when I catch it, I let it go and it feels uh, embracing and tranquil, but I can really feel an overload when I catch eyes with a woman or I'm talking to her. What do you suggest? So he's having trouble letting that go. Well, we've said it a dozen times, feel that. Can you hang in there a little longer to let all of that, just that sweep of emotions just, uh, uh, just flood your body? There's no right or wrong. There's no success or lack of success. It's an opportunity. What she's giving you is an opportunity to feel. And what do you think he's resisting that he could feel more of? The over, like if he, like think about, you ever, you ever look at a woman's eyes and it becomes too much and suddenly just you're, you go into intense of vulnerability. Yeah. Or, yeah. or you fly into your head or, uh, uh, what is he feeling? I think that if he was to allow himself to feel the embarrassment, shame, shyness in front of her and own it and even call it out, oh, you make me really nervous. Yeah. That's going to start to move it in the right direction for the future as he gets more comfortable. I tell you guys that you'll be amazed when you confess, that when you finally confess to a woman that you're nervous talking to her, her reaction, uh, they usually gives them something to feel like, oh, he's shown he's showing up and he's saying he's nervous, they usually, whether they're attracted to you or not, will that opens their feminine. It gives them like a chance to, oh, he, to nurture you a little bit. They usually touch you on the arm and say, oh, you don't have to be nervous. Hmm. Yeah, they, they, they give you one caveat to that. You can't go inside and, and, get sh and shut off and say, I'm nervous, go, I'm nervous. You're making me nervous, like, 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 you're, like something bad is happening to you. You got to open up and let them yeah. see it all and own it like a man. Yeah, I'm nervous. And then, wow, you're making me embarrassed. And let her see you own it. Fucking powerful. The first one's needy. Please fix me. The other yeah. one is, I don't need fixing. I'm nervous. Yeah, yeah. It's fun stuff to do. Um, okay, let's go to Igor. I'm gonna, and then while you answer this, I'm going to count how many we got left and get a little uh, feel for the rest of the call. I'm still stuck with the, st with the statement about the already broken heart. Hit it hard. I was bullied as a kid, and any effort I made so far seems like it came from the head. I seem to be much more numbed out than I previously thought. Any advice? This question has the vibe of deep grief, um, and it's a it's an opportunity to really feel down into that into that grief. You know, 
you can find them. I would do anything you can because right now, now we've seen with men that men are afraid of grief because if there's a sense that if they start crying, I think this is in a letting go book that they're, that they'll never stop. It feels like for me, it's like starting to cry feels like that, you know, when you're vomiting, you're out of control and that's what crying feels like. Um, I would do, because I, I feel you, you're walking around with a broken heart. Um, and can you feel safe with yourself to feel that broken heart? Can you feel your broken heart from your, from your masculine and says, okay, here's a, an observer saying, here's a man, not you, that's feeling all this. Can you just be there with him? And even if you feel it just a tiny bit, that's the pathway up the ladder. Step, small step by small step. Awesome. Great answer. Uh, now what I'm going to do, because we're at an hour and a half, I'm going to go through a few more questions and, and, can, and I'm going to let you answer. I'm not going to answer. I'm okay. going to see if you can answer them more rapid fire because we got 18, we got 18 more questions to answer. <laughs> if I answer them all, I, we're not going to get to them all. Okay. But if you can go fast, we can get to a few of them. So, you know, so let's see what happens. Uh, Issa, hey, Brian, love your content. Uh, John Adams. So once you release those emotions, thank you, by the way, Issa. Um, so once you release those emotions and resistance, do people feel that difference? Yes. Simple answer. They very much do. Yes. John? Yeah. Now they're connected to you. They can feel you. They can, you're not a talking head. That's great. Jonathan, for, for you guys, what is the difference between releasing like David Hawkins and being present like Eckhart Tolle? Is releasing the same as being in the now? Great question. Wow. That's a, that deserves a whole webinar. Yeah. I think it does, but we'll have to put that on a list of, of, of webinars for the future. Um, the thing, Eckerd, I've, I've only read the book once, uh, his, one of his books once. Um, I didn't feel it as much as I felt David Hawkins' book. I think they're saying the same thing, it's being with whatever's now. Eckhart's really talking about the welcoming portion mm -hmm. and the being in the now as he's coming to acceptance of what is right now. Yeah. And uh, so he really emphasizes that welcoming portion. So, um, Sito, would you rather recommend a meditation based on going deep on trauma and release it or a meditation based on being in the moment, no thinking type? Um, I, my personal practice is uh, I was never good at meditating in a traditional sense of being in the moment, but it really helped me to, when I meditate on my body and what I'm feeling, um, that is much deeper for me. So to each his own, but releasing trauma is feeling trauma. Perfect. Um, hey team fearless. Can you provide actions to take consistency every day to build up your confidence? Even you, when you are staying at home, that would be like a morning ritual or a daily ritual, which I'll probably do a video on at some point. Yeah. You're going to do a video on, on, uh, on, on virtual approaching, approaching, Yep. through energetic modeling and feeling it and, and imagining in your mind and how you're doing it releasing along the way yeah there's going to be a lot of that uh, the release you can do the releasing program you can do the energetic mo modeling for a class and all of that will have different practices you can do and then we have tons of videos out there where we teach this stuff too so um so watch those the future videos coming up because we'll be covering this very topic a lot more because it's so important yeah and also, if you want one specifically on consistency, read um, The Slight Edge by Jeff Olson's best book on consistency I've ever read. It's a phenomenal read. Just a, it's a phenomenal book, period, on uh, daily practice and consistency. Um, anonymous, how can I overcome my sexual shame? Please direct me to any resource or therapy if available. Take uh, our sexual transmutation workshop. It's probably one of the best resources out there if, if you can get into it. But if not, what else do you recommend, Sam? Uh, that's where my mind went. That cracked me open and turned me into a dirty bastard. So <laughs> there you go. So that's one. Um, uh, you could look into some of like uh, maybe the enlightened sex manuals got some good little meditations in it. Um, man, I haven't, I've read, it's been years since I've really looked at this book, but a uh, man talk, she is a uh, way of the, uh, way, the multi-orgasmic man. Um, David Data's book. Is that the first one you mentioned? Yeah. Uh, that's really great. Enlightened sex manual. Um, yep. You could look at some of uh, Jaya's work, um, Jaya. Miss Jaya.com. 
got great stuff there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a program out there that's, uh, I think, pretty damn good. Um, it's got a lot of good little practices in it. What's the name of that program? It's just, I didn't do it. Somebody else did it. But we're going we're gonna to possibly do a new version of it, I think, at some point. Uh, George, what was the name of it? Stamina Secrets. So check out Stamina Secrets. Uh, and we can put a link in here on that, too. Um, next one. Hey, thanks for the amazing content. I have been playing with the letting go process, and I think it works to some extent. It works really well if you keep getting better at it and keep going deeper. It's like a language in the beginning. You, you might stumble a bit, but this thing, trust me, this can change every part of your life. But I still have some difficulty feeling letting go of resistance. Do you have some practical tips like visualizations, et cetera? And I'll just say that you got to let go on resistance itself. Welcome resistance, acknowledge resistance, accept resistance. Matter of fact, I would do that. I wouldn't even let go. I would just welcome resistance and get to know it for several days a week and then go back to releasing some of it. Sam, what do you got to say? That's like, that was my answer too. Okay, perfect. So Omar, hi, Sam. Is there a difference between self-acceptance and self-love? If so, what is it? You know, I was going to say no difference, but I can feel vibrationally self-acceptance feels a little bit passive, where self-love feels deeper. Um, to accept something is like, I accept it. It's, it's like, it, I would just reframe it into self-love. Well, can, w- let's play with this idea. Can you have self-love if you don't have self-acceptance? Yeah. Or does the self-acceptance Ooh, come uh, actualize the love? Um, that's what I'm right. It's just a, th- a theory here. No, I, I, I feel that totally. That's, that's, that would put love higher up on the chart of emotions than, uh, you know, got to go through acceptance to feel peace and love. Yeah. And that's how Hawkins has it. He has the love above the acceptance and, and it's the welcoming portion of releasing. You welcome, accept, allow, and then you can, and then once you do that, you can open up and express out and release. And then that allows more expression. So, um, uh, we'll get a couple more. Ike, uh, if you've developed a strong heart connection but still have numbness in your pelvis, can you itemize some steps to rectify this? I covered that earlier in this video. I Hopefully you caught that. I talked about things you can do as far as moving in your pelvis, rocking your pelvis, real brief. And that's where also um, Stamina Secrets is great, uh, Sexual Transmutation is great, or those other books I just recommended would be great too. Um, but I, and what I'd say to that too is that I've done this is like, oh, I can feel the heart connection, but I really want a cock connection, but you're skipping what's in between. Yeah. Skipping, That's the, stomach, skipping the, the juiciness of confidence and fear or everything that's in your third chakra too. So the remember the heart sexual, you can just skip your stomach and you're not really there. How much does the heart and the third chakra together feed the second chakra, the turn on as it comes down the front of the body? Yeah, there's because it starts to gain power for me. It's like this is where the power is, my stomach. So Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, so for time's sake, we're way over. I'm gonna read one more and then we're gonna call it a webinar. Um hey guys, loving the webinars. Thank you guys. Well, you're welcome. As you guys uh starting to talking start talking about connecting the heart with your turn on. People really like this topic. How do you cultivate this? I've experienced uh, ED. Okay. I think he's saying ED. I said, I was going to say Ed. <laughs> I've experienced ED, erectile dysfunction, at an early age due to emotions uh, wanting to release. I'm now 21. We kind of answered that. Uh, it's, it's, it's your, it's, you're kind of missing the in-between part. If you're just, again, there's push down there and there's expectations and, uh, you know, the thinking, of course, that's going to affect your, uh, your hardness. Yeah. So let it flow from your heart and make sure you don't skip it and try to push things out through your cock. Yeah. So stamina secrets, um, moving your pelvis, moving in your stomach, moving in your heart, um, uh, David Data's uh, Enlightened Sex Manual, The uh, Multi-Orgasmic Man by Mantak Chia, all stuff that develops awareness. It's all going to start with awareness and coming to acceptance and appreciation of that part of your body. Even releasing, just doing releasing on that part of your body, and especially the welcoming, allowing portion, 
for and, and give it and, and set a period of time, a week, two weeks. If it's been a chronic problem your whole life, maybe even a month where you're not even going to judge it. You're just going to do it every day, even if you feel nothing. Because trust me, nothing is something. Uh, and and a month later, you'll evaluate. It's like getting on the scale every day. Don't look. Don't do that. Sometimes things go backwards and get and feel worse before they get better. It's very common. So you need a period of time before you come back and evaluate. A good long period of time. When you especially when you're deep in it. Uh, there have been some questions about the books. I'm sure we'll find a way to get all the books uh, to you guys in some kind of follow-up. Yeah, Jonathan uh, takes down a lot of this stuff and sends it out in an email as a follow-up or posts it. Are you going to be doing that with this, Jonathan? Uh, I see Mike did put that in, so that's cool. Okay, uh, and Jonathan, are you going to put any of this on the Facebook page or in an email? Yeah, I'm going to be putting everything together, sending the links. We already have a, we already have a list of... Uh, books recommended by you so i'll just share it again with uh, okay with the sounds great um especially the books we get a lot of questions about these books on sexuality so those two books are good and stamina secrets and so forth so uh that'll be great um so guys it was an awesome call i want to thank sam for being here he rocked it uh sam's you know it's just amazing in his communication with his heart and uh so guys really let that sink in that's that's his what his mastery is. We have another um, webinar that's going to be going on. The next one is, uh, is it tomorrow, guys? I don't even have the list in front of me. <clears throat> that's tomorrow. Um, and we're going to be covering releasing. So anybody has questions about that, <clears throat> make sure you get this one. So all the questions we have about releasing, <laughs> tomorrow's the call. And I'm probably going to be, we're going to be playing with different concepts and gets very abstract sometimes. So really come prepared for this one. Um, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. And I think it's going to be a powerful, powerful webinar. Again, I'm going to ask that you guys uh, uh, share this webinar with other people. Uh, share the, uh, if you think somebody would benefit, male or female, uh, from these webinars, ask them, uh, share it with them, ask them to, get, to sign up for the page, send them a link, um, thefearlessman.com slash 21 days, and get them signed up because there's a lot of material here that doesn't have to do with dating. It just has to do with personal growth and especially the releasing content tomorrow. That can be used on anything, guys. So whoever you think can be on that call, get them on the call with you. Get them on and, and let them listen and let them help them to grow because remember, the more people we help, the better we're going to come out of this uh, this great pause, as I'm calling it. Um, that we're in right now. We're gonna come out strong, powerful. The more people you inspire, the, the more you get paid back in, in life. And that's the way it works. The more people you help, the more life gives back to you. So let's get out there and help as many people as humanly possible. Now, as far as you guys that didn't get your questions answered, if you really want the question answered, repost it in the Facebook page mm -hmm. um, so that uh, so the coaches can see it and maybe uh, take a different shot at it. Um, and uh, so basically, as I said, share, uh, if you're seeing any of this content on YouTube, this isn't going out to this, the ending here is not going to be on YouTube, right? Or is it? I was going to live stream them again for like a few hours and then take it down just to okay. let people see what they're missing out on. But uh, all the replays, guys, again, are going to be in the Facebook group. So if you can't make it, just come back a few hours later after the call. The replay will be in the Facebook group. Okay. Well, wherever you're watching it, make sure to like. If you haven't liked, make sure to comment below. Your comments are important to us. That's how we know what you like, don't like, what, what you want more of, and especially tell us what you want more of or if you have any questions or you're stuck, whether it's YouTube or Facebook or wherever. That's all huge. Um, if you're on YouTube, make sure to subscribe and to hit that notifications button. And uh, with that said, I want to thank Sam one more time. He's awesome. We want to get him out here doing more stuff. His, uh, he really teaches you how to love yourself because he's so good at himself. And, um, and I and want you guys to practice that Jim Carrey batshit crazy, unreasonable, embarrassing love for spend an hour in your apartment or in your neighborhood, do it and post how the world starts to show up on the Facebook page. And just yeah. be curious about what's, what's going to course through you. Sam, can you do me a favor? And on the Facebook page, can you put a post just for that assignment that people can comment in? Absolutely. That would be awesome. So look for that post, comment in it after you do the exercise and, and, and let them know what you're experiencing. And we can follow up from there and maybe it'll become, expand and become something bigger. Who knows? This stuff can expand really fast. So again, thank you, Sam.
he was awesome. I love how he really, really opens his heart and experiences vulnerability. Um, maybe one of these days we'll get him to play one of his sad ukulele songs on, on, on the webinar. I got two or three more good ones. <laughs> <laughs> First time I saw him do that, he had the whole room crying. He did such a good job. So a bunch of girls in, in Bucharest were crying. It was a powerful, powerful moment. So, um, so with that said, guys, remember, only the confident really live. See you yeah. tomorrow. We love you. And yes, we only the confident really live, but only the loving really live. <laughs> <laughs> That's been better. <laughs> there we go. Take care, everybody. Bye. Yes.